Welcome to the Reach Podcast with your teacher, Pastor Taylor Gabbard. For a time, I uh, there was a certain series of videos I liked on the internet when I was um, early into my military career. They were called stolen valor, stolen valor videos. If you've ever seen, if you've ever seen one of those videos, typically. It's some soldier or veteran who has spotted somebody out in public pretending to be a soldier. And they're typically pretty funny. The best part about them is just how, to a soldier, it's blatantly obvious how much the person faking is faking, right? Just from sight. You don't even have to talk to them. As soon as you see the video or the picture, you're like, wow. That guy just, it's like he didn't even try, didn't even do his homework. And there was this one particular video that I liked the most. Some veteran doing, you know, doing school, he's out of the service and he's, he's on a college campus and he sees this guy standing on a college campus and without remarking on how many different things were wrong immediately just from seeing him, he was, he was wearing a ranger tab. And a ranger tab is an especially coveted badge, and it is, I think, less than 1% of the military has them. And this guy didn't look the part just to be basically in the military, much less to be wearing that very coveted badge. And so this veteran approaches him, and he's pretty combative right off the bat. He starts kind of arguing with him and asking him questions and exposing that he's not a real soldier. But at one point in the video, he says, take that ranger tab off. And the guy he's talking to does. And then the the veteran yelling at him starts screaming, that proves you're not a ranger because no ranger would ever take that off. See, he knew In that moment, if he had any doubts left that this guy wasn't really a ranger, he knew that he was faking as soon as he was willing to take it off. He was never a ranger to begin with. See, I know that in the early days of my career, if somebody had told me to take my ranger tab off, I would have said, over my dead body. And honestly, I think that would have probably proven to anybody I was talking to, I earned it. But this guy didn't have that. He didn't share in that process. He wasn't truly what he was identifying as, and so he caved immediately. And it was obvious from the start that he wasn't what he said he was. We're in a series on 1 John. 1 John is the assurance book. It's the book where we see what a believer looks like, how to identify in ourselves if we are a Christian or not. See, here's the thing. We struggle with assurance all the time. It's one of the worst battles you can have in your spirit is not knowing if you actually died right now, would you go to heaven? It's horrible. It'll keep you up at night. And the beautiful thing is that God never wanted you to live in that fear and doubt. He wanted that it would be obvious to you who you are, whether or not you're his child. And so the book of 1 John is laying out these obvious indicators saying you can tell if you're a believer or not. Now, the Bible never really gives us a way to know for certain in someone else because people can fake it. And they can mimic some of the indicators. But at a minimum, you should be able to look in your own life and say, I know that I know God. Right? And that's the the word play going on, right? We know that in the the context of the book of 1 John is that there are heretics invading the church. And they're saying, you don't need Jesus to know the Father. We have special knowledge. We know something you don't know, and that gets us to the Father without Jesus. And John comes in, and he says, no, that's not how this works. There's no special knowledge, but there is a way that you can know in your head that you know God in your heart. And then he spends the entire book saying, 
In order to know the Father, you have to know the Son. And if you know the Son, you will know the Father. And there's no way to know the Father if you don't know the Son. Now, the book of 1 John is called, uh, it's not really typical for the epistles, like the way that Paul writes them. It is a amplified sermon. So what does that mean? An amplified sermon is that John is essentially writing this letter as though he's preaching, and the way that he's preaching is he's essentially rotating through concepts, and he rotates through those concepts multiple times, but as he does it, he essentially makes them more crystal clear. He fleshes them out and hones in on them, and he's emphasizing points by essentially repeating them from different angles with different analogies to aim at the same point. Now, the reason that matters is because if you read 1 John, a lot of it feels repetitive. That's the point. And honestly, part of the point is that it's pretty simple. There's these indicators, and no matter which way you look at it, that's what a believer looks like. It's obvious. And you, at a minimum, should be able to look into your own life and see your faith. The question I asked two weeks ago was, what is the significance of your faith? See, if your belief doesn't have significance to you, if it doesn't cause an action, it doesn't matter. Or if it causes an action that is not in line with who Jesus is, that's a problem. Right? And we talked about the fact that if, if I came into a room and I said, I said hey, the, the building's on fire. And you said, okay, I believe you. And then you sat there, and everyone else ran out of the room, and you stayed here while the building was on fire. I would tell you that something was deficient in how you believed because it didn't affect your actions. It had no significance. See, the point of James, James says, even the demons believe. And he's not, and he says, even the demons believe and they shudder. And his point is not that demons have some kind of system of faith. His point is that the result of their knowledge of God is that they are afraid of him because they are enemies with him. So the question is, what does your faith produce in you? The first question I want to ask you tonight is, what do you love? Because if you're saved, then you will love he who saved you. So we'll start in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. You cannot have competing loves. If you are with someone and they cheat on you and they say, well, but I love you, there is something out of order with either how they love you or whether or not they love you at all based on their actions. Their actions don't align. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we adulterous towards God who is supposed to be who we have a relationship with? Verse 16 says there are three things to, to love in the world. There are, essentially, I want you to see this. There are three kinds of temptations in the world. Now, before I get into this, I want to just, just take a, a side note. There is an entire sermon just right here in verse 16, right? You could stop here forever, but we're not going to. So we are going to blow through this a little bit fast, but, but keep up, I guess. The first one we see is the lust of the flesh. This is uh, pleasure, comfort, you know, food, if, if it goes to gluttony or sex outside of marriage, right? The lust of the flesh. Now, I want you to see this. All of our doctrines of sin go back to the Garden of Eden. Everything we know about sin is rooted in chapter 3 of Genesis. And everything is then fleshed out across the entire Bible, but it all starts right there when we're talking about sin. And so in the Garden of Eden, Eve saw that the fruit was good to eat. She had the lust of the flesh. That was one of the temptations that caused her to disobey God. And then later we see that Jesus, at the height of his weakness, in the lowest point, 
out in the desert in the wilderness fasting. The devil says, just turn those stones, those rocks right there, turn those into bread. And he's offering him a physical way out. He's offering him a way to satisfy his flesh. And Jesus turns him down. Because Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone. See, he understood that there was something more important than just being physically taken care of. As a matter of fact, if you're physically taken care of your entire life, which you have a good chance of that happening because you live in America in 2024, and yet after all that time of being physically taken care of, you die and go to hell, what did that get you? It didn't matter at all. See, the reality is, if you will discount God's guidance in your life because you think, well, I got to take care of this need. First of all, at a baseline, you're not trusting God to take care of that need, but we're going to skip past that for a second. Here's the reality. You are forsaking what you truly need for temporary need. You're, in effect, discounting what eventually leads us to martyrdom, right? Why have believers throughout Christian church history died for the faith? Because it was more important how they stood on Christ in their spirit than that they actually stayed alive. Here's the thing. A lot of times we tell ourselves, I wouldn't deny Jesus. Someone put a gun to my head, I wouldn't deny Jesus. And yet, we deny Jesus over physical things every single day. You don't wake up one day and have a gun put in your face, and then just all of a sudden, it's more important to you that you love Jesus than that you stay alive. You practice that every single day. That's what the lust of the flesh is. Then we see the lust of the eyes. This is greed, discontentment, covet, coveting. Now, Eve, she looked and her eyes were delighted by the fruit. It looked pleasurable to her. It looked like something good, something she wanted to have. Ultimately, the lust of the eyes is to take your eyes off of the only thing that matters. It's to take your eyes off of Jesus. It's to take your eyes off the word of God and look at the things that he has made and replace him with the things that he has made. Romans tells us that we, we traded the creator for the created thing. That's what Eve di did in the garden. In that same way, Jesus was offered a whole kingdom. He was offered to rule the world by Satan if he would only bow to him, if he would only do it his way. See, here's the thing. The world has all these beautiful things that we want. And God actually does give us some of those things. But very often, we don't get them at the rate we want them. We don't get them. We definitely don't get them when we look for them for the wrong reasons. James tells us that too. And the reality is, we decide, well, I'm going to go get the things of the world on my own. I'm going to go get the things that delight my eyes instead of waiting for God to give them to me as gifts. Here's the thing about gifts that don't come from God. They aren't gifts. When God gives you a gift, it is a demonstration of his love. I've, I, I've used this analogy several times. If someone who is very uh, close to you, important in your life, came up and said, hey, this was my grandfather's watch, and I care about you so much, I want to give you this watch. And you took the watch, and you went, awesome. I've been waiting to get this watch. I don't need you anymore. Deuces. That would not make any sense. You would have missed the point of the gift. The gift was a representation of their love for you. It wasn't the point in and of itself. And yet we do this in our lives all the time. We trade the gift giver for the gift. See, here's the thing. Jesus turns down ruling this kingdom that Satan is promising to give him, partially because it wasn't Satan's to give, that's the first lie, that Satan has something to offer you. And the second part of that lie is Jesus wasn't going to trade the thing that God was going to give him in an even better form. That, if you've ever sat in my office and I've drawn a really just dumb looking house for you, is kind of my entire argument when it comes to dating. Quit going after the first thing that delights your eyes and let God give you something even better that he has for you. 
That's the whole point. The last one is the pride of life. This is, whether it's temporary or spiritual, it's an achievement complex. But here's what it is. It's achievement apart from God. It's I'm going to get renown. I'm going to have everybody see who I am. Essentially, this is the one that makes me God in my life. Right? They all make me God in certain ways. One is I'm providing for myself. One is I'm gathering things for my own glory. And the last one is I am actually the only thing that should be worshipped. And I'm going to accomplish that. Eve wanted God's wisdom. She wanted what was rightfully God's. And she didn't want to get it from God. She wanted it her own way. Jesus is told he can prove he's the son of God. He doesn't have to go to the cross. He doesn't have to be crucified and rise again. He doesn't have to go through all that. He can just jump off this building. God will send his angels and everybody will know immediately. See, it's a shortcut. There was nothing that Eve was going to attain in that garden that God wasn't willing to give her if she had just been obedient. But we want to do it our own way. We want to take what is God's from him, make ourselves. God. And Jesus says, I will not test God. Because Jesus knew that God had a plan and that plan was perfect. And he didn't have to take the short way. See, the devil questioned and twisted God's word. And if you notice, if you go back to Genesis, Eve didn't even really know God's word. She gets it wrong. She adds to it. She was unsure of it. And so the devil is able to look at her and say, did God really say that? See, the alternative is that Jesus himself responds with Scripture. See, when, when the devil says, did God really say that, we have to be able to say, well, God said this. This is what I believe. This is what I will stand on. That's how Jesus walked in righteousness. Look at verse 17. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that, that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be evident that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Essentially, this section, John is saying, the love of the world, the lo uh, loving the world is of the world, which is passing away, but the love of God is of God, which brings eternal life. Verse 18, he says it's the last hour. Why should you get your assurance settled? Why is that the most important thing you'll ever figure out? See, you assume that you're promised tomorrow. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about, I know there's like this morbid route that, that always kind of comes at this point of a uh, this topic where it's like, you could die tonight, right? Okay, maybe. Or in the next 10 seconds, Jesus could come back. You don't have to die, but you are not promised tomorrow because tomorrow might be judgment day. And this is worth figuring out now. He says there are, even though there's one antichrist right now, we see that many of them are coming. See, I want you to see this. The spirit of the Antichrist is just the denial of who Jesus was. It's the denial of Christ, right? I want you to understand all sin is the denial of God's word. That's what sin is. Sin is you denying Christ. Okay, that, that's what happens when we sin. Now, there's a difference, and we'll talk more about what happens when a believer stumbles, but there's a difference between that and those who are actively living in sin proclaiming that Jesus is not the Messiah. That's what the world does. And everybody whose message that is, is in the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, I, I have no idea who the Antichrist is going to be. Or even if there's going to be this one specific person. That seems to be what the Bible indicates. It's a little muddled. That's the thing about prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet. We don't know. The point, though, is 
every single person in the world who is actively telling you that Christianity is false is the Antichrist. And they can't say Jesus isn't the Messiah and then claim cultural Christianity. It doesn't work like that. It stops short of the true gospel. Now, this denial of Christ, this is what John is talking about. He's talking to these heretics that, that say, you don't have a need of Jesus. You don't need the Messiah. You don't need Jesus to, to get to the Father. And in verse 19, Paul, uh, John says, they were never of us. Now, this is a key verse, okay? Here's what I want you to see. You cannot lose your salvation, okay? It's not a thing. Now, there's plenty of places we can go. We can go sit in Romans. We can talk about how nothing can take you away from God's love. We can sit in all these places. But, but we're going to focus in right here, and I want you to see this. The, the, the point of never being able to lose your salvation, it brings us to this place because we all have that relative, that person that we know that seemed to be a believer and then walked away from the faith, and we're asking the wrong question. We spend a lot of time saying, well, but could they still be a believer, or were they ever a believer, or did they lose their salvation? And none of that is the point. You know why? Because even your best friend who, is, who sinned yesterday should be pointed back to the gospel. I don't care if somebody's living in sin, if they fall in sin, if they stumble in sin. The whole point is to point people to the gospel. So instead of wasting your time trying to figure out if your cousin actually is a believer, instead, you should be sharing the gospel with them. Because if they're not walking with Christ, they need to hear the gospel. It doesn't matter. And that's why we're not given x-ray vision into people's souls to see. And we go, uh, well, they're not living like it, but they're a Christian, so I don't need to worry about it. No, if you have a question about whether somebody's a Christian or not, go tell them the gospel. I'll tell you what, if you don't have a question whether somebody's a Christian or not, go tell them the gospel. That's the point. That's the whole goal. And so instead of wrestling with that question, which is really a way to excuse yourself from having a hard conversation, go share the gospel. Listen, there are people in the church who, they are the cultural Christians. They're kind of on the outer circle. They, they're not really believers, but they think if they're close enough, right? We, we don't have a problem with that. That doesn't bother us because we're like, okay, that person, at least they're here and maybe they'll hear the gospel and maybe I can have a conversation with them. And then we know that there are people that infiltrate the church that are antichrist, they're heretics, and they try to steal the sheep. And that doesn't bother us because they show themselves, themselves real fast and you can, you can notice that somebody is not a real believer, what bothers us is this group that we think they're a rock star. What really shakes us is when you thought that person that just walked away from the faith, they were more mature than I was. Here's the reality. That person was a rock star in the church on their own power. They had said, maybe if I get in the church and I get close and I serve in all these places, I do all these things, then I'll feel like a Christian. They're trying to save themselves. And as soon as they fall away, what do they show us? That they were never of us. It doesn't mean, listen, that guy that took his ranger tab off, he didn't stop being a ranger when he took the tab off. He proved he never was one. That's the point. If you fall away, it's not that you've lost your salvation, it's that you never had it. And he says verses, that's one option. The other option is you who have received an anointing. He's talking about being saved. He's talking about anointed by the Holy Spirit, that you walk in faith, that you know who Jesus is, that you know the truth, that Jesus is the Messiah, and you cannot mix that truth with lies. Once you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not talking about the fact that you'll never doubt. That's just, that's part of your flesh. That's part of your weakness. You're going to wrestle with doubt. You're going to wrestle with apologetics. That's why apologetics exists. I always tell you guys, apologetics is not a way to argue your non-Christian friends into believing the gospel because there's still a step of faith in there somewhere. Apologetics is for you, a believer, to settle the lies in your head from the enemy that this isn't true, okay? Ask those questions. That's good for you. You grow in that. I'm not saying if you ever have a doubt, you're not even a believer. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm saying is, there's a difference between that and denying that Jesus is your Savior. That is, not, is someone who was never a believer. 
He says there's no lie in the truth. So then the question becomes, who are the liars? And now he's going to give us a profile for that. Look at verse 22. Who is the liar except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that, when you, see that what you heard from the beginning remains in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. Anyone denying Christ as Lord has the spirit of the Antichrist. Verse 23, I want you to see verse 23. I'm going to read it again. This is essentially the thesis for the entire book of 1 John. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. That's it right there. That's the crux of the issue. You either have Jesus and eternity, or you don't. And the question is, how do I know that I actually have that? Some of you might say, I, well, I don't deny Christ. I would never deny Christ, and yet you live like somebody who's never met him five, six days out of the week. You can't just show up to church on Sunday, like sing the hymn and listen to the sermon and be like, check, Mark, I'm going to heaven, got my ticket punched, I'm done. Now, it's not about earning your salvation. It's about the question is, the other six days of the week, what makes you think you're saved? What if you don't die on a Sunday? I don't, like, what are you going to do? That's not how it works, right? You can't just be in the building. The oldest question the enemy asks is, did God really say? I want you to see this. This is an attack on God's word. It's a denial of God's word. It's a denial of Jesus. Because God's word, the Bible that you're holding, it is a description of, at every moment of who Jesus is. And here's the thing. This is why Paul says we see an imperfect version and someday we'll see a perfect version. John's gonna say something similar to that in a minute. That essentially, when you look at the Bible, you're trying to see Jesus' face and it's really hard to see somebody's face in words. That's why we do discipleship because when people live out Christ in front of us, we go, yeah, that's it. That's Jesus. I read it right here. That person's doing it. That's the whole point. Because it's really hard to see otherwise. That's how we live this out. And so someday, this book is going to be standing there right in front of you. And you're going to go, now that is Jesus. That's everything. That's who he is. You'll see the description actually in front of your face. See, if instead of denying Jesus as the Messiah, you confess and believe in him, that's what remaining is. That's how you abide in Christ. If you have the Son, you have the Father. What does it mean to confess? It means to depend on. It means to declare Lord. It means to make him everything, your only hope, your expectation. This is Versus the, the, the heretics who are saying, we don't need the son, we just skipped straight to the father. Even though Jesus said explicitly, I'm the only way to the father. Jesus, by the way, didn't say, I'm going to take you along the way to the father. He said, I am the way to the father. These are very different things. Do you love your savior so much that you'll sacrifice the world? I'm not talking about perfectly. I'm not saying you'll never mess up. But is there one of those three temptations that you're death gripping because you don't trust God to provide for your physical needs or you don't trust God to, to show you amazing things in his word or in, his, in who he is or because you've decided that you want to get all the things that life has to offer for yourself on your own and in, in and of your own power? Don't. Death grip the world. Death grip Jesus. Verse 25 is going to be a bridge statement. Look at verse 25. It says, this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. Why does this conversation matter? Because Jesus is the one who made the promise of eternal life. And without him, why love 
God at all? With, why love God if, there's, if God hasn't already loved you, if God already, hasn't already made, made a way for you? That's the whole point. Your love of God is a response to the fact that God has loved you first. I want you to understand something. Heaven is not a location where Jesus happens to be. Wherever Jesus is, is heaven because Jesus is there. I, I, I don't even remember the lyrics at this point. I don't listen to the song anymore, but is it Tyler Childers who has a song about that he doesn't want to go to heaven if he can't take his hunting dogs? He's missed the point. <laughs> Heaven's not some place where he's going to be with his hunting dogs and Jesus just kind of like also there. And he may be with his hunting dogs for all of eternity, but if Jesus isn't there, it's not going to be good. That's the point. Look at verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing which you have received from him remains in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you uh, about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you remain in him. Now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not draw back from, from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness also has been born of him. He says, I'm writing you these things because of the liars. Now, I want you to see people abuse verse 27, right? If you take verse 27 all by itself, a lot of people will go, see, all I need is a Bible and the Holy Spirit, and I can do church at home. Okay, but here's the problem. You have to rip verse 27 all the way out of the context of 1 John. I mean, you cannot look at literally anything around it for that to make sense. Because as soon as we have the context, what is the context? He's talking about these people who are lying to you about not needing the church, about not needing your brothers and sisters. He's saying you can't be deceived by those people because you have the Holy Spirit that teaches you. You ready for this? You want to know an assurance of salvation? That when you open the Bible, the Holy Spirit teaches you things. If you open the Bible... And, and I'm not talking, I get it. Sometimes our quiet times are dry, right? Again, none of this is designed for you to just like panic. Like one day you're like, I didn't get anything on a quiet time. I'm going to hell, right? That's not the point. The point is that you would open up your Bible every single day and over the course of your life as you read it, the Holy Spirit would draw truth out of it and implant it on your heart. And if that never happens, you have a problem. Because one of the assurances of salvation is that God talks to us when we read his word, he teaches us. John is saying, you don't need somebody to point out to you that these things are lies. Because you have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will show you that these things are lies. And what's the base? The two base lies of this book that he's fighting are, you don't need the church, and you don't need Jesus. Jesus. Do you think the Holy Spirit in your life ought to be able to cover those two without a lot of big theological concepts? I don't think you need to go to seminary for those. Like, that is pretty much the cut and dry gospel. And that's the point. You can have the Holy Spirit defend you against at least that much. He says, instead, remain as children not ashamed of when the parents get home. We've all lived this experience, by the way. There's a difference between dad's home and dad's home, right? And here's the thing. That verse is not actually a verse about, that verse is actually not a verse about saying saved or not saved. That's the crazy thing about this. He's saying live in a way that you know for certain you're saved, so you're excited when dad's home. He's not saying, he's not saying uh, if you don't live in a certain way, you're definitely going to go to hell. That's not the point. The point is, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, if I'm living as a disobedient child, then when dad comes home, I got to go, <laughs> hope I make it, right? That's not the goal. 
The goal is to live in such a way above reproach that I know that if dad came home right now, it's going to be great. That is the goal of assurance, to have confidence in the coming of Christ. Those, are his, those who are Christ are becoming Christ-like. They are becoming righteous as he is righteous. They're pursuing righteousness. He says that if you're pursuing righteousness, you're born of him. Okay, what is righteousness? It's right standing, right? It's to be right with God who you're previously at war with. So how do you achieve righteousness? How do you pursue right standing? Okay, ready? This is the gospel. It's already been given to you. That's the point. It's not that you're chasing it down, that you have to go get it. When you believe that Jesus saved you, it's already been accomplished. That's how you can believe in it. That's the whole point. The gospel is not, I got to do all this stuff. The gospel is because I'm saved, because I'm set free, I don't have to walk in sin. I can walk in righteousness because it's already been given to me. It's already been imputed to me. I am like Christ more and more each day because someday I will be like him perfectly. When we obey God, we show God that we love him. Well, why do we love him? Because he's already saved us. We don't obey him so he'll save us. We obey him because he saved us. That's the point. Why do you love him? It's a response to him having loved you. Do you believe God loves you more than the world? Or do you, by your actions, display that you actually believe that the world loves you more than God? Who do you believe loves you? The world will not love you if you love the Father and if you love the Son. The world will actually cast you out. Now this, this when we get into chapter 3 here, this is when it really begins to show itself as an amplified sermon. Because it's going to feel like John is repeating himself. But I want you to see how important what he's saying is. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. See how great the love the Father has given us? How great a love the Father has given us? That we would be called children of God. And in fact, we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself just as he is pure. God loves you so much that he has called you his child. And not only has he called you his child, he has made it so. Some of you grew up with a, an adult friend of the family that you called your second mother, your second father. Here's the problem. If there was ever a falling out with that second parent, that's just it. Like you just couldn't go over to their house anymore. That's not what this is talking about. See, that is somebody who just calls you son or daughter. This is talking about legal adoption. This is talking about you becoming God's son or daughter by legal covenant, by binding. He has not just called you son or daughter. He has made it so. Now, what do we know about somebody who adopts a child and then treats them poorly? That's not right. That's not what a parent's supposed to do. We know good adoptive parents adopt somebody and then love them like they are their own. Well, God is the perfect parent. So when he adopts you, he loves you the same way he loves Jesus forever. That's why you can't be separated from him. See, earlier... Or earlier I was talking about being able to see Jesus right in front of you instead of just the description of Jesus, right? Seeing the true word instead of seeing the description of the word, right? 
What he says is when you finally see him, you will be able to be just like him. See, the reason we do discipleship is we mimic each other mimicking Jesus. But we're all just taking our best guess based on what the person right in front of us is mimicking. Now, that goes all the way back to Jesus. I would, I'd be willing to say that the apostles are probably the greatest mimickers of Jesus in human history because they actually walked around with them, right? That's why they got to write scripture. But we don't have that privilege. We have the description. And someday, you won't have to guess at how to be like Jesus. You won't have to, to wrestle with the description because he'll be standing right in front of you. You know this. Who do you hang out with? Who do you act like? Who you hang out with? And if you get to hang out with Jesus suddenly it'll be a lot easier to act like him. That's the goal. In verse 3, he talks about Christ's likeness again. He says, a hope. This is not wishful thinking, but it's an expectation in Christ that since he was pure, you are pure. That you have been given that purity. Are you pure like him, or are you hedging your bets? Are you keeping one foot in the world just in case God doesn't come through? See, the whole point of this book is that if you're keeping one foot in the world and one foot in God's camp, the best you've got when you ask yourself, am I saved, is I don't know. It doesn't mean you're not. It's not that God cast you out. You might be saved. But how do you know? Do you want to guess? Or do you want to have confidence? In his coming. Look at verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who remains in him sins continually. No one who sins continually has seen him, or I'm sorry, no one who, yeah, no one who sins continually has seen him or knows him. Okay. If I walk up to you and I say, hey, I want to play a game, and you're like, cool, I'm down, and I'm like, go, and I take off running, what are you going to do? you are be like, what the heck game are we playing? Like, if I don't give you any boundaries or limits, I just say, okay, the only rule is freedom. We can't even play a game. We can't even figure out what we're doing. It's just chaos. Here's the thing. Freedom only exists inside of limits. If I walk up to you and I say, hey, I want to play a game of basketball, all of a sudden, there's a bunch of rules and limits, and you can do whatever you want inside of those limits. If I say, hey, I want to play a game of chess, you are now free within the rules of the game of chess to play the game. The thing about limits is limits actually make freedom possible. I want you to see something. The world wants to tell you that it is Christianity and the Bible that enslaves you and gives you all these rules. And that true freedom is you got to get rid of religion, get rid of God, and do whatever you want. Okay, let me just ask you a very simple question. Which one are you enslaved to? Sin that you cannot stop doing no matter how hard you seem to try, which seems like the definition of slavery, or... God's word, which you can't seem to do no matter how hard you try. See, slavery is the one that dominates you and makes you do things. Not the one that you can't achieve if you were given every advantage possible. The whole point is that sin is what enslaves you and dominates you. Not Jesus, not the Bible. The Bible gives you limits in which you can live freely. I used this illustration a couple years back. I said, no one has ever seen a fish out of water suffocating and said, look at how free it is. Not even trapped by that water anymore, just living its best fish life. That doesn't make sense. Here's the thing. Where's the fish most free? In the water. It's in the water that that fish has freedom to live and survive. And sin wants to pull you out of water. It, you know, you could take that illustration even further. How do we get fish out of water? We bait a hook. That's what temptation is. It looks good 
until it snatches you and tries to kill you. Freedom is within limits. How can you be free in Christ to sin when, when Christ came to take away sin? That's not the way it works. Verse 6 is tricky. Verse 6 is one of the verses that kills us. And I actually love what the, the NASB does here. Um, guys, translation is hard, first of all. Just understand that. If you, somebody says, why are so many translations Bible? Because translation is difficult, okay? And one of my favorite things about this verse in the NASB is it inserts meaning in certain places based on the study of the language. So even though this verse probably sounds literally more like no one who remains in him sins, in the NASB they've added no one who remains in him sins continually. Why? Because it's a perfect tense verb. It means no one who is in Christ lives in sin, chooses sin, is dominated by sin. That is not, the, the verse, if you just, if you leave out continually, it gets really scary. Like, no one who believes in Jesus sins. Oh, I'm out. I'm out every second of every day. I have no chance. But that's not the point. It's not about stumbling. You're gonna stumble. Listen, I don't care if you see it. <laughs> I don't care if you woke up today and you're like, I don't know, today was pretty good. Like, I think I got it. No, no. You sin all the time. There's literally a verse in Psalms that tells us that, that we ask God for forgiveness for our unintentional sin. Okay? You're sinning. It's just with you. The ones you see, are just that's just when it comes out. But it's in there whether you see it or not. Okay? So if you can't see it, that's not the point. The point is, are you choosing it? Are you living in it? Are you justifying it? Because that person does not know Jesus. Which one are you doing? Are you choosing sin and justifying yourself, or are you repenting and confessing? See, here's the thing. I tell you guys the difference between guilt and shame all the time, and I failed to make this, this connection here, okay? A believer can have guilt. They can have done a bad thing, but they cannot have shame because they are not the bad thing, right? Here's the difference. In the world, they haven't received forgiveness, which means they are not just guilty. They are their sin. Somebody who has not been forgiven is their sin. As believers, we have been freed of that. We are not defined by sin. And because we're not defined by sin, we don't have to live in it. Well, I'm just an alcoholic, so I just, I just drink. No. You have maybe been guilty of having too much to drink, but that's not your definition. That's not your identity. You're free from that. Look at verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you the one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who has been born of God practices sin because his, because his seed remains in him and he cannot sin continually because he has been born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother and sister. In this moment, he amplifies it to the max, right? He takes it to the next level. He says, he's been saying, anybody who practices righteousness is righteous like Jesus. Anyone who, is, who sees that Jesus is pure is practicing purity. And then he finally gets here where he says, anybody who's living in sin is of the devil because the devil is the one who produces sin. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil, and if you are of Christ, you are rejecting sin. Now, I want you to see this. Verse 10 is literally all over the Bible, okay? He says in verse 10, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Assurance should be obvious. So then why do we struggle with it so much? Look at the two things he says, make it obvious. He says, practice righteousness 
and love your brothers. Okay, what does that sound like? Let's go to James. James, instead of practice righteousness, says remain unstained by the world. And instead of love your brothers, he says visit, or visit orphans and widows in their distress. Let's go one more step. Where is this repeated over and over and over again? Every single place where the Bible says love God and love others. That is what only the children of God can possibly do. See, here's the thing. You can love God because you see that he loved you first. You can respond. Now, how do you see the love of God? It's, it's like invisible, right? That's what justification is. It's the objective truth. You've been made right with God. He made you right, so you love him. But how do you live that out? By loving others, by loving the church, by loving the poor and brokenhearted, by doing good deeds. It's still a reaction. It's still a response. But guess what? It's obvious. And, and, and it's not done because you, you're trying to show off how good of a person you are. It's not done because you're, you're trying to earn salvation. You're trying to get critical acclaim for yourself. It's done because you understand that you have been rescued and set free, and you can't help but love now what God loves, which is people. And then, what do we always talk about? It's a, it's a perfect circle. How do you love God? You love others because that's what he loves. How do you love others? You point them to God because that's how others receive love. Now, do whatever. I, like I always tell you guys, bake your neighbor cookies as an excuse to go tell them the gospel, right? You know, I, I can't, I can't like, I can't mention this probably every sermon, but I might. That phrase, share the gospel, and if necessary, use words, is not biblical, okay? The sentiment is we should live lives that match the gospel. Got it. You have to use words. You have to. You have to open your mouth and the gospel has to come out. And you know what? Practice on the people in this room because they need to hear the gospel too. It's an encouragement to us. You can either love God and love others or you can love yourself and the world. If your salvation isn't obvious to you, it's because you are depending on a prayer you prayed at some point in your life as though that, by the way, show me the verse. It's not in there. At no point does God say, are you a believer? Did you ever say the magic words? That's not it. So how do you know you're a believer? It's obvious by the way you repent, which is loving God, and love others, which is loving others, right? When you live a life of repentance, you are acknowledging your love of God. Now, again, that's not languishing in shame. That's looking at your guilt and going, I don't want that. I don't want that garbage. I want to be free of that. I want to respond to God by sharing the gospel. We can know that we know him. It can be obvious. The Bible says if, you're, if your salvation isn't obvious, work it out in fear and trembling. It, it says that because it's trying to show you that this is the most important thing you'll ever do. And you, and you have no idea. I mean, again, Jesus could come back tonight. And then that's it. Are you going to be ashamed of his coming? Or are you going to have confidence in his coming? Make whatever sacrifice you need to make, repent of whatever sin you need to repent of, what could possibly be more important than knowing that you're a child of the living God? I want to have confidence at his return. I don't want to have fear and trepidation. I don't want to have to try to shove all the bad stuff in the nearest closet and hope he doesn't look in there. I want to fling the door of my 
house open and go running into my yard going, finally, finally, no more. We get to be with him. That's what eternal life is, with him. Don't, listen, don't, don't leave tonight, but definitely don't get all the way through this series and still not know if you know him. And it not be obvious to you that you're his child. Settle the issue. There are people all over this room who want to share Jesus with you. People all over this room who want to be with you in heaven for all of eternity when we get to do real life. You know this is the counterfeit, right? This is the partial. Let's all go to the perfect. This week, wrestle with the reality of your salvation and ask yourself the hard question, is it even obvious to you? Hey guys, this is Matt O'Mealy, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that is defined by real transformation and the sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We are available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.